Hello everybody, I'm filmed again. I know it's hard to tell the difference, but if you look closely you can see that this version of me has no popped collar. Pause the video if you have to, it's very subtle. So anyway, I was thinking about making another video about Islam because I realized it's been a very long time since I did. And I realized something incredibly odd, which is that I don't think I've ever responded to Zakir Naik, who's one of the most popular apologists for the religion. Well okay, I have responded to him, but not in public videos. I've responded to him a couple times in supporter exclusives on Patreon and Subscribestar. Which by the way, in case you're not aware, I've made 50 exclusive videos for my supporters. I think that's worth mentioning, I think it's kind of a good perk. Um, you know, just saying. I'm not trying to say anything, but, you know, I'm saying something. So anyway, we're doing Nike today. Good evening, Doctor. Sales manager from shipping company. So these clips are from these speeches Zucker Nike has given. I don't know how old this particular one is, it was just put up on his YouTube channel a couple months ago. It could be years old for all I know, it's kind of irrelevant. It's not as if the points ever change, is it? Anyway, when I was first exposed to these after I watched the first few of them, the openings of them started to feel really odd, and that's because everyone introduces themselves by their occupation. I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman. <laughs> There's a lot of businessmen. And in this case, sales manager from shipping company. And I don't understand it. I mean, I would understand it if it was relevant to the point being made, right? If someone said, hey, I'm the person behind such and such paper on whatever psychology, theology, and I want to ask you a point related to what was in that paper, then it would make sense to me. Or if it was some sort of professional conference about business strategies, then as well it would make sense. But no, these people are encouraged to always introduce themselves with their profession, which is strange. I mean, is this forming some sort of central part of their identity? This guy doesn't even give his name, he just gives his job title. Of course, mentioning this is not relevant to any point that's going to come up in the video. I just thought I'd point out that it feels really odd to me. I don't know if it's a cultural difference, but it feels very sort of worker bee-ish, very drone-like, to identify yourself not by your name, but by your position as a sales manager. Is the hell and paradise are there? How as a common person I believe? I don't believe in any religion. So are hell and paradise real? What reason is there for a common person like me to believe this? I don't believe in any religion, is the question. He's reading it off a note card and stumbling his way through it as if he's never read it. I'm gonna make the charitable assumption that he just wrote it down because he has a bit of difficulty with English, and that's also why he's stumbling through it, and not that somebody wrote it down for him to read as a pre-planned question. Brother, what is the definition of religion? Religion is a way of life. How you lead your life. Wow, that has got to be the broadest definition of religion I think I've ever heard a religious person give. Many people say that I don't mind, I'm just a human being, I'm born, I will do test and error, and I will know how to lead a life. Yeah, when you combine that with wisdom from others, you know, people who've learned the hard way, a bit of cultural knowledge, a bit of instinct, a bit of social pressure, a bit of science, a bit of mimicry of role models. Yeah, that actually works surprisingly well most of the time. Almost everybody makes it through to the end, and the rest of us will get there eventually. For example, you go to a forest. You are going to a forest the first time. You don't know whether the fruits are poisonous or not. If you start eating any fruit, you may end up eating a fruit which is poisonous and you may die. What do you do? You ask an expert. Well, I suppose that depends on your definition of expert. I mean, you don't really need an expert, especially if you have an entire society that's been living in that forest for millennia. If a child goes out into that forest, pretty much anyone older with a bit more experience living in that world with knowledge of the consequences will be able to provide advice, at least. Sometimes they might be wrong. I don't know if they count as an expert necessarily. But at the very least, they can say, ah, no, that berry, that's poisonous. And the reason they can say that is because someone got poisoned. Not because they asked an expert, but just just because someone got unlucky, because they saw what happened to their friend. And the people in that society shared that knowledge with each other, and now they all know that berry's poisonous. And the reason they share this knowledge with each other is not because of some threat of moral punishment if they don't. It's because they want to see each other the next day. It's because they want to have a society where people aren't just dropping dead all the time. It's not even a thing they think about. They don't justify it to themselves. They don't morally philosophize about it. It's just what they do. This is how most of humanity works, especially with their in-group. So an adult tells the child that's gone off into the forest about the berries. And maybe in response the child says, well, what's so bad about being poisoned? Why wouldn't I want to be poisoned? Isn't wanting to not be poisoned just a subjective preference? No different from wanting to be poisoned? No different from preferring the taste of one fruit over another? And the adult says, yeah, well do it then, you little smartass. And the kid says, no, I don't wanna. And the adult says, yeah, exactly, so shut up. I don't know. Well, in the sense of if you're uneducated, if you're ignorant as to which actions have which consequences, sure, asking someone who has the experience or who has the knowledge from handed down experience, from the fact that a hundred years ago someone died from eating the berries, is advisable. 
Now, of course, if you've seen videos like this before, it's pretty obvious we're getting into a moral conversation here. The question was about heaven and hell, but for some reason we're going to have the completely unrelated moral argument. And so in the moral context, the consequences of an action are going to be analogous to the consequences of eating the berry. But that's not going to address whether those consequences matter to you. It's not going to address whether you care whether you get poisoned, or whether you morally care about the consequences of your actions. Which in both cases are going to have to come from you, not from someone outside of you. Doesn't matter what the consequences are, whether or not you're concerned about them can only be a decision made within you. And of course this is why morality at its most basic foundation is subjective, regardless of whether it comes from your biology, your culture, individual experiences, all of the above. Those are what shape your subjective preferences. But subjective preferences shaped by objective processes are still subjective preferences. They're not objectively true outside of yourself. And I'm getting way ahead of myself, I know, but I mean, I've kind of had this conversation so many times at this point that I guess I just want to get stuff like this out of the way early on, I don't know. When you get the who do you go to, brother? When he gets to go to go to, brother? When you get the who do you go to, brother? Hmm, that's very insightful. I agree. I think. Maybe. When you are sick, who do you go to? When you are sick, who do you go to? Okay. Yeah, okay, I can see how that'd be a bit of a tongue twister if you're trying to go over at lightning speed. The doctor is an expert in... Treating sickness, correct? Well, wait a minute now, why would I go to a doctor? Is there something wrong with being sick? I'm not sure I buy that. This seems very much like you're relying on subjective preferences. What expert did you ask about this? You can't say that I'm a human being. I will treat myself. What? Yeah, you can. Of course you can say that. Depending on the illness, it might not work. Then again, depending on the illness, it might work to an extent. I mean, that's what people used to do in the old days. Granted, they didn't exactly have controlled studies to show them what actually works and what doesn't at a rate better than placebo. But again, at the very least, they survived through to the end. Jokes aside, the human species survived. And not only survived, but devised all of medical science, learned literally everything the doctors know from scratch, so that now there are experts that you can ask. And we did all of that with no experts to ask. Pretty impressive if I do say so myself. Good job, humans. I think we might just figure this life thing out yet. The experts on anything, regardless of what subject it is, did not always exist. In fact, most knowledge involved in most expertise didn't exist until the last, like, 200 years. Experts don't exist until humans make discoveries and then humans make themselves into experts on those discoveries. And now we're going into a discussion on morality, which I'm 99% sure is going to turn into a discussion on why we need God to tell us moral truths, to be the moral expert. But the example you're leading us into that with is of people creating creating expertise for themselves. Are you sure that's the example you want to give? No. That's what the Quran says in Surah Nahal. Oh, right, yeah. If it's what the Quran says, then I guess it's fine. Why did that get applause? Just because you mentioned the book? The Quran says in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter 20 verse number 7, if you don't know, ask the person who's expert. No, it really doesn't. It does not say, if you don't know something, go and ask someone who's developed the relevant expertise through a lot of study, who's studied reality in depth and the actual consequences of actions through experiments and observation. No, it's just more ranting from Muhammad about why you have to believe him when he tells you stuff. Say, my Lord knows every word spoken in the heavens and on earth. He is the one that hears and knows all things. Nay, they say, these are medleys of dreams. Nay, he forged it. Nay, he is but a poet. Let him then bring us a sign like the ones that were sent to prophets of old. As to those before them, not one of the populations which we destroyed believed. Will these believe? And then here's verse 7, the one he actually mentions but conveniently doesn't quote because he's in the middle of saying that this says something it doesn't say. Before you also the messengers we sent were but men, to whom we granted inspiration. If if you do not realize this, ask of those who possess the message. See, we're not talking about experts here. We're not talking about doctors who studied medicine. We're talking about people who just claimed they speak for God and that's it indistinguishable from everyone else who also did the same thing. Where's the expertise here? Yeah, they claim God's speaking through them. Okay, well, I don't know if he is. Maybe I should ask an expert on the leaders of historical new religious movements and cults. Not so easily found, though, in 7th century Arabia. Guess I'll just have to stick with I don't know. I mean, after all, without an expert to ask, I really can't decide either way, can I? Similarly to lead a life, we have to ask the expert. Now, who is the expert? Uh, the person whose life it is? Maybe not when they're young and inexperienced, but once they get older, yeah, you could say they're an expert to an extent on their own life. But at the very least, they're the main stakeholder. Who's the expert? The person who created us. Why? 
Why would that be the default answer? You're not a table saw. You're not a mindless tool. You're a sentient entity, separate from the god. The god might have created you wanting you to do a certain thing, hoping that you would, but that doesn't make it objectively true any more than if your mom and dad want you to do something specific. Be a doctor, whatever. It's a preference, not a truth. And you can choose to be concerned about it. You can say, listen, I care what you think and I would like to pay attention to it. Okay. You can do that with your parents too. You can do that with your kids. Interestingly, a lot of people feel that their purpose really radically shifts once they have kids. It's no longer defined by their parents, by the people who preceded them, who created them, for lack of a better word. It becomes much more defined by the people they created. Many parents care so much about their offspring that it starts to redefine what it is they want from their life, what they feel like they're for. Not a total shift, but definitely a strong influence. Now again, as for the God thing, obviously we're assuming for the sake of argument that God exists, okay fine. I'm not saying that you can't lean on parents or a creator or whatever for advice, right? The creator, if he has absolute knowledge of everything, probably has some reasonably good amount of expertise that you can rely on, right? Just like you go to your parents and you say, hey, listen, I have this problem, I don't really know what to do, I don't know what the different outcomes are gonna be, I don't have enough information, I don't really understand it. They have more expertise, in this case from experience, and they can give you advice. And similarly, if you could actually talk to God, that God would have more expertise in the form of omniscience. And so maybe asking for some help with decisions to understand consequences could be helpful to you. But again, just like with morality, or just like with the berries, this comes down to the distinction between your subjective preferences and the objective consequences in reality of your actions. Whether you care if you're poisoned is your subjective preference, whether you are are poisoned is not. You could certainly get advice from God on whether you will be poisoned if you eat this berry, but what that means to you is going to be your decision in the end. And similarly, this God could be an expert on the consequences of your actions on your life, but what that actually means to you, what you consider to be a good life, and what consequences you want to happen, that's going to be up to you. So what exactly does it mean that God is an expert on how to lead a life? He might be an expert on how causes lead to effects, but that doesn't mean he gets to decide what effects you prefer what kind of life you want to lead. Who created us? It's Almighty God. Oh, you hadn't got to that part yet? Oh, sorry. Um. Oh, God. I didn't see that coming. So, we have to follow the commandment of Almighty God. Wait, why? Actually, why? You didn't even say why. You said, so we have to follow the commandments of God. So as in therefore. But there was nothing really before the therefore that leads to the therefore. You can't start an argument with therefore. If you do not believe in Almighty God, you should listen to my video cassette, Is the Quran God's Word? Yeah, I'll get right on listening to that videotape. Is this speech actually that old or are you still selling video cassettes? Where I've proved logically and scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wow, proved, huh? Haven't heard that before, sounds like I'm really missing out. If you're an atheist, are you an atheist, brother? Are you an atheist? Pardon me? Pardon me? <laughs> yeah, I might even hesitate for a second answering that question in that room too. Are you an atheist? No, no. Not an atheist. So what do you, do you believe in God? Actually, I believe in the power, but... Oh, come on, man. Could you give more of a cop-out answer? But, okay, fine. Like I said, I don't necessarily blame him. There's a lot of pressure standing there at that particular microphone. If you're not a real hardcore atheist, you might just kind of soften things up a bit for the crowd. Really doesn't change the nature of the question anyway, does it? Fine. That means you believe in God. <laughs> you I want believe... to call it power, you want to call it supernatural, you believe in God. For context, the title of this is Dr. Zakir Naik scientifically and logically proves to an atheist the existence of hell and heaven. But apparently Naik himself doesn't think so. It's like, I believe something. Something. But you don't know the name. That name is God. <laughs> you may call it power, you may call it anything. You see what I mean about the crowd? That's a whole lot of social pressure right there to not say, yeah, I'm an atheist. Bravo if you do, but I'm not going to be a dick about it and more incomprehensible applause. If you don't believe in God, then you listen to my video cassette, is the Quran God's word. If you don't know who that power is, yet you listen to my cassette, is the Quran God's word, where I've proven scientifically, undoubtedly, existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Quran is the word of Almighty God. Yeah, like I said, I'll really have to get right on that. Um, I mean, I won't, but hey, you never know. I did not ask an expert if I will. Now coming to your question, if you say about power, that means you believe in a religion. Because religion by definition, according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means a belief in a supernatural controlling power. 
according to the Oxford Dictionary, that's the definition. Really, that seems like an exceptionally simplistic definition for Oxford. I mean, even you don't define it that simply. Before, you said it's a way of life. So at the very least, there's more to religion than just believing there's some kind of controlling power. Let me just take a look here. Number one, a state of life bound by religious vows, the condition of belonging to a religious order. Number two, relating to the Christian church, A, a particular religious order or denomination, a religious house. B, a member of a religious order, specifically a member of the clergy. C, collectively people devoted to a religious life. Number three, A, action or conduct indicating belief in, obedience to, and a reverence for a god, gods, or similar superhuman power. The performance of religious rites or observances. B. A religious duty or obligation. Number four. A. A particular system of faith and worship. B. Figurative. A pursuit, interest, or movement followed with great devotion. Right, so figuratively, rock and roll was his religion. C. Chiefly in French contexts, Protestantism. Five. A. Belief in or acknowledgement of some superhuman power or powers, especially a god or gods. That's the closest to what you said they defined it as. Which is typically manifested in obedience reverence, and worship. Such a belief as part of a system defining a code of living, the way of life thing you said, especially as a means of achieving spiritual or material improvement. B. Religion personified. C. Ah, dread. 6. The religious sanction or obligation of an oath or similar bond. And number 7. Figurative, strict fidelity or faithfulness, conscientiousness, devotion to some principle, also an instance of this. So look, I don't know when you gave this speech, I don't know if they've updated their definition since. It is possible that at some point they had an incredibly simplistic definition there. I mean, some people do define religion purely as belief in a god or belief in a supernatural power. I think it's a completely worthless definition. I don't think it has any value whatsoever. I do not think every theist is religious. While I don't personally think that there are any very good reasons to believe in a god, I think it is possible to be rationally convinced that a god exists and yet not behave or believe in a religious manner towards that god. There have been plenty of deists in history who believed in a god, maybe not one that interferes in the world, but in a god in general, and had a distinctly non-religious attitude about it. It was just a thing that they thought was probably true, similar to anything else people believe. And very likely there are at least some theists who feel the same way. So yeah, I think you were more correct the first time when you said a religion is a way of life, which is a definition I think is way too broad, but this one I think is way too narrow, and I think that's even less useful. What well, word is that? That means you believe in a religion. If you believe in a power, that means you believe in a religion. Um, no, not by any useful definition. I think you're just picking the definition that you find convenient in the moment. What if you believe in a power and you don't follow it as your way of life? Well, then it conflicts with your previous definition. Could you try for just some consistency here? What is with this crowd, seriously? It's almost as bad as Kent Hovind's crowds. Religion, according to Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a supernatural controlling power a personal god or gods that deserve obedience and worship. Oh, a third definition from you. Okay. So now it's not just belief in a power. Now it's belief in a god or gods that deserve obedience and worship. Okay, so why'd you leave that out the last time? The guy said, I believe in a power. Well, did he say, I believe that power deserves obedience and worship? Or did he just say, I believe in a power that does something in the universe? Just something. Never said what. Not that it matters what it does. I mean, let's say it does everything your god does. Let's say it is your god. I don't believe your god deserves obedience or worship. It might get it just by terrorizing people into it. But does it deserve it? No. And if I had any sort of coercion-free choice in the matter, would I follow a religion dedicated to it? Uh, no. That means you believe in religion, you don't know the definition of religion. Oh, please. You've defined religion three different ways in five minutes. So don't say I don't believe in religion. Religion is English word, brother. Religion is English word. If you open the Oxford Dictionary, it says religion means a belief in a superhuman controlling power and you believe in a power. Oh, now we're back to definition number two. I'm curious if you even notice the distinctions between the definitions you're giving. Like inside your head, these are probably all the same, right? A superhuman controlling power. Well, that's synonymous with Allah because I have no imagination. And I think Allah is worthy of obedience and worship. So if you believe in a supernatural power, you must think so too. And since therefore you believe the supernatural power is Allah and is worthy of obedience and worship, you must be following it as your way of life, even though absolutely none of those things are necessarily true about you and I just put them in your mouth. Right, Zakir? 
Those three definitions you gave are completely inseparable in your head, and probably, in fact, completely synonymous. And therefore everyone else must lack the basic ability to distinguish between obviously distinct concepts just like you, as if they had the mental aptitude of a three-year-old. Or a personal god, or god that is a worship obedience. Yeah, the definition as you presented it was not, you believe in A, a supernatural power, or B, a personal god worthy of worship and obedience. The definition was, you believe in a supernatural power or personal god, as one thing, and whichever of those it is, it's worthy of worship and obedience. And then of course this isn't even the definition on Oxford's website, so I don't know how old it is. I wish I knew when you gave this speech, I'm starting to think it might have been quite some time ago. Oxford's newer definitions seem a little more robust, I have to say. Although still not perfect, I mean religion is a hard thing to really define because there's so much difference between them. But I certainly would not define just belief in a power as religion, because that's so broad the term loses all usefulness at all. To know more about that power, you see my video because it is the Quran God's word. Now coming to your question, basic question, how will I prove that there is hell and heaven? Which at this point in the conversation I assume is based on the premise that God exists, because supposedly you've proven it. To this atheist, who believes in a supernatural controlling power which could be defined as some kind of a god. Assuming it thinks and, you know, behaves like some sort of thinking entity. Seriously, why on earth are we calling this guy an atheist? You say he's a religious man who believes in God. Maybe your definition of atheism is as worthless as your definition of religion. Do you see how when you define things far too generally, they stop being useful? Now if you hear my video because I've proved many scientific aspects in the Quran. Holy shit, dude, I know you want us to buy your videotapes, okay? What is this, the fourth time? Chill with the marketing, okay? We got it. But let me take a break and tell you about our sponsor, viewers like you. If you like this channel, consider supporting it through Patreon, Subscribestar, PayPal, Bitcoin, find my P.O. Box address and send me your engagement ring, buy my book that hasn't been written yet but will be ghostwritten by my cat, and now press the left arrow key on your keyboard a couple times to go back like 10 or 15 seconds and listen to this four more times, okay? But really though, thank you to my supporters and thank you for watching. I'm gonna come back to this and then I'm gonna do it again and again. I have a lot to say about this speech. This is quite the train wreck. And at times it's a good prompt for some slight tangents. So come back for the next part. And before you go, please give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. Sign up to the email list for early access, list.logic.com. And I'll see you next time.